Team, let's jump into our session today. And we are certainly joining you in some very different times. I know that we've got people that are going through some very difficult situations, uh, certainly to those in Queensland and also into northern New South Wales. So if you are in one of the flood affected areas, certainly we are thinking of you at the moment, doing everything we can to help and to support. I know also too that we've got some very different situations happening right the way across Australia and also New Zealand. So we're going to jump into our training session today. So let's jump in and have a ton of fun around what the best agents are doing to really make sure that they build a ton of momentum in this particular period that we're operating in. And I'm just going to take you through some important things that we're having conversations about. And that big one, without a doubt, is, is that really you've got to really think about productivity in this current era. It almost feels as though the pandemic is done and off the, off the back of that, we're in a position that now we are snapping back to reality very quickly. And the first thing I want to open up with is a key quote by the incredible Tom Peters, where he says that, you know, the interesting thing is that your calendar never lies. And that's so true, right? If we actually went back through your calendar over the course of the last week or so, and we had a quick look at the total number of appointments that you've done, whether or not it's buyer appointments, market prices, or listing appointments, then ultimately that calendar is really telling us the truth about where you're sitting in terms of your momentum. And at the end of the day, the calendar always knows about where you've been and what you've been doing. And in order to be able to go and get a ton of momentum, it's really important that you stay focused on the activities that are ahead. And this is important because the way that we spend our time is our only true reflection of our actual priorities. Now, the reason why I get you to think a lot about that is that we've got to be spending our time in the areas where we know we're going to be getting a result. And it's critical that you actually start to have this whole idea that the way that we spend our time really is our strategy. Now, there are lots of different things that are actually going on. We've got long weekends that are happening in different parts of Australia. Also, off the back of that, we are in a position that we're starting to see some changing in border restrictions in what's happening in New Zealand, as well as responsible lending laws that have actually come in as well. And so you need to be actually being very agile about how you can go to deal with these particular issues and challenges of the day. The way that we spend our time is really what we care about. And ultimately, the way that we spend our time is who we really are. And I want you to start thinking that you've got to start thinking about how you've got to navigate the conditions that are ahead. Now, we're only five weeks out from Easter. Uh, then off the back of that, we have an Anzac Day long weekend here in Australia. In Melbourne, we also have the Grand Prix, uh, literally, oh, sorry, the Formula One that's literally just going to be just prior to all of that. And then in addition to that, we're also heading into a federal election in the Australian market. So there's lots of different challenges that there are markets within markets in both Australia and New Zealand right now. We're certainly hearing that properties um, selling under a million dollars in New Zealand is becoming a little bit more challenging with the, with the responsible lending laws, but properties over a million dollars are still flying in the majority of those marketplaces. So today we want to get you into this whole idea that you know, your primary job is to really be a leader inside of the industry. And this is such an important part because you've got to maximize the contribution and the impact of your entire team. And the best way to do that is to get you to really think, you know, about how you can make sure that, you know, you're getting on the phones, you're creating appointments and creating plenty of opportunity in what it takes to be a great real estate agent. Now, as a part of that, our last best experience in any industry now determines our expectations of every other experience from that moment on. And we're now in a world where literally people expect us to know. So, you know, one of the interesting things that happened was that Rafael Nadal won the Australian Open and it was his 21st championship for his career. And within a minute of him actually winning that championship, uh, Nike actually had a video that celebrated that moment that was posted to all of their social media and different channels. And the interesting conversation is that Nike had obviously pre-prepared that prior to him winning the championship. And it got me to think a lot about what real estate agents actually do. So prior to turning up to an Open for inspection on Saturday, do you have a list of the buyers that you know that are going to be turning up? Do you have a list of the sellers that you've invited to that particular open for inspection? Do you have a list of the people that have already bought a copy of a pested building report? Or maybe those people that are coming back for a second time on that particular property to make sure that you treat them a little bit differently at that open for inspection. And then this is such an important conversation that before you actually put the sold sticker up on the board, do you have a list of the sellers that are in and around that particular property that need to know about that particular sale? And this is such an important conversation because what we're starting to get you to really think about is it's about how you go to create an experience for today's customers in new and better ways. Now, why is this such an important conversation? Because the whole idea here is, is that excellence is the only thing that really matters on the inside of business. Now, we have got a ton of things that are happening in the consumer's world. There's a lot of consumer confidence, which is tied up with what's happening in the media. There's a lot of conversations about the perception of interest rates actually increasing. And what we did find actually happened in New Zealand is that the first interest rate increase actually saw property prices increase 
by 2.5%. And the reason behind that is that there was this initial rush where a number of buyers wanted to buy to try to lock in interest rates at the current level. Now, in the Australian environment, what we are seeing is certainly the threat of interest rates being used a lot by buyers wanting to pull back and maybe not bid as high on auction day. But what we do know is that interest rates in Australia have actually unofficially already gone up by 0.8% over the course of the last eight months. And the reason that that is that that's what we go to call the four-year fixed interest rate has actually gone up by 0.8 of a percent, which would effectively be around three, if not four, interest rate increases in the variable rate to actually equal the current four-year fixed rate. And this is such an important conversation is that you've got to start thinking that when a buyer says to you, you know what, we're actually just not going to buy because interest rates are going up. Well, they need to be really careful because rents are also going up as well. And we are starting to see that, that literally across the country, rents went up by 9% last month. And that's really this whole idea that people are moving back to the cities from the regional environments. There's a lot of international students starting to arrive. And off the back of that, there's over 700,000 migrants that have not come to Australia over the course of the last two years. We know there'll be some significant changes in New Zealand as well when they start to open back up for travel, which has been one of the major exporters for the New Zealand economy. At the end of the day, the secret to being a great real estate agent and really thriving in these times is to make sure that you've got speed, accuracy, and high quality in your execution. Now, speed is obviously you know, the speed at which you get back to a client. Accuracy is making sure that you are accurate in the information that you give. And execution is about making sure that you do the things that you said that you're going to do. Now, what we're seeing a lot with agents right the way around the country is this whole idea now is that they've got to get back to prospecting. Now, you're either in a position that you're prospecting for buyers or you're prospecting for sellers. And this is that whole idea that after you've gone through such a long sustained boom period of the last 18 months to two years, right the way around the country and in New Zealand, that all of a sudden you're in a position that you need to be going back and finding great buyers. Now, this is a really important part because A-grade stock is still selling really well. But any properties that are B or C-grade that have a structural defect, a bit of an issue in relation to that particular property themselves, they're actually in a position now that they're suffering a little and you need to be really good at doing high-quality buy work. Now, it was the subject of a podcast that we published this morning. And the whole idea is that you've got to go back and say, okay, I've got this two-bedroom property right now. I'm going to go back to a previous campaign that we did maybe three, four or five months ago. And I'm going to jump on the phones and go and call the buyers that physically inquired or inspected that particular property and see if I can drag them across to the current property that's on the market today. And this is understanding that you know consumer confidence is certainly impacted by the threat and the conversations of war and what's happening in Russia and the Ukraine right now, which changes what people feel about what's actually going on inside of their environment. Also, too, very much nationally here in Australia, the flood crisis combined with the election that's coming up in the course of the next few months, that does actually start to slow consumer confidence, particularly in markets like Canberra, where all of a sudden they say, look, we're just going to literally stop and wait. So we're now in a, in a world where we have markets within markets, and it's really important that you understand that if you've still got a great market, run with it. If your market has started to soften, then you need to switch the tools that you're actually using to make sure that you can get property sold. This will be really important to go to watch what we go to call the digital intent of consumers in helping them to be able to go and make some better quality decisions for the future. Now, at the end of the day, in business, we know that people buy your energy. So if you're energetic, if you're driven, if you're focused, if you know what's actually happening in your market, then you will shift your entire value proposition. And this whole idea is that it's massively important now for you to be making sure that you're looking after your energy in a really powerful way. Now, the secret to being great in any market, good, bad, or indifferent, is having phenomenal product knowledge. And that product knowledge is really earned. You know, this is that whole idea about what's been listed in the course of the last seven days, what's been sold in the last seven days, and who actually needs to know about that particular listing or that particular sale. Now, a lot of agents haven't picked up on this as being a major market mover. But if you are in a position that you see a new property has actually come on the market, even if it's come on with a competitor, if you're in a position that you've got a buy that you know would buy that particular property, and naturally, if they bought, would have to sell their existing, then that is a great way to be able to win business uncontested by referring them to the property they should go and buy, helping them to negotiate on that particular purchase so that naturally you get the opportunity to list their existing home. And this is such an important part is that if you want to find loyal sellers, 
then the skill is to make sure that you're helping them to fix their problem of finding them something to go and buy. Now, that market knowledge really is the game. And this is what some of the best real estate agents do. They go to the major real estate website in their particular country. They type in their particular location. They see what's been listed over the last seven days. They see what's been sold over the last seven days. And then they then build that into a very specific email that they send to their buyer and sellers. So this is where there's real power in segmentation so that you can actually say, okay, great. We've already got the normal email that goes out inside of our active pipe. But then in addition to that, we're actually going to have powerful segmentation where we're going to create a second template to actually go specifically towards people that we know are naturally buyer sellers. Now, this is such an important part because we've got to see where the market's actually moving today. Now, Heron Todd White came out with the National Property Clock. This is Australian orientated, but there's no problems for you being able to adapt it into New Zealand. And basically, the idea is that every market is seen as being in a rising market. New data has indicated, for example, that Sydney is the first of the majors here in Australia to actually move into a negative territory with a 0.1% decline in property prices across Sydney over the course of February. That's the first time that's happened since around the middle of 2020. And the whole idea is that you are starting to see a market that is beginning to soften. We honestly believe that this particular document is around 30, 60 or 90 days behind what you're actually seeing on the ground. So as a real estate agent, you will start to notice it with a lower number of buyer inquiries, a lower number of physical inspections, either through private appointments or open homes, or in addition to that, people not coming back for a second appointment, requesting copies of contracts, buying copies of pest and build reports, you know, as a part of that conversation. That actually then does typify that then you've got a market that can move into starting to decline, which is naturally where the sellers are up here, the buyer's offer is here. By the time the sellers um, come down in their asking price to where the buyer's offer is, the buyer's already moved down, or going to find something else, and all of a sudden the buying pool is then again well below where the owners are. And naturally that happens for a period of time. Now, I wanted to go and do some research on this because what actually is happening at the moment is we are seeing a renewed interest in people wanting to buy units. And the reason for that, why there's an increase in unit price is that literally the amount that houses went up has been quite significant and units only had about half of the growth of what housing did. Now, the interesting conversation is, is that now there's a lot of people moving back to those city environments. There's international students starting to return, which has actually substantially dampened the actual vacancy rates of units. And so naturally off the back of that, investors are moving back into the market to try to purchase. Now, the February statistics on investors indicate that 32.6% of all of the home loans that were given out in the Australian environment over the course of February were actually given directly to investors. So investors start to return. They really love to be involved in the marketplace. And the whole idea about that is that as rental yields start to return, then naturally investors flock to come and buy those properties which is why we are seeing an increase in unit prices. Now, let's have a quick look at some data. And this is a really interesting conversation. After notching up the fastest annual price growth in decades last year, Australia's biggest housing markets now face the prospect of falling prices that could last for years if past downturns are any indication. The surge in COVID-19 cases associated with the Omicron variant could push some of these policy tightening decisions back with APRA or the RBA unlikely to tighten their policy settings with so much uncertainty. Now, we are definitely seeing that uh, in New Zealand right now. Obviously, the spread of Omicron, the threat and the fear about where that's actually at is literally probably six to eight weeks behind what we actually have seen here in Australia. And what we know is that once we get back onto the other side, we literally are resuming life as we knew it before the pandemic. Now, the interesting idea here is that since the late 1980s, so this is 30 years worth of data, national downturns have ranged in severity from a 1% peak to trough in 1516, which was a temporary correction brought about by APRA's first round of credit tightening via their 10% speed limit on investment lending. And this was basically the idea at that particular point in 1516, out of the 100% of home loans that went out, 50% of them were going to investors. APRA naturally said, you know what, no more than 10% of home loans can go to investors. And what actually happened there is that you would believe it, four in 10 buyers were withdrawn from the marketplace in under 90 days. Now, off the back of that, we've seen an 8.4% decline in prices in the 1719 downturn. Now, this is interesting because the GFC correction of 0809 lasted for 10 months. 
during the 2010-2012 downturn, price had, had fallen for 18 straight months. And then they dropped for 19 months during the 17-19 correction before bottoming out, according to CoreLogic data. Now, as such, the recovery could also take years if it follows the 2017-2020 uh, 2020 housing slump, where prices took three years and three months to bounce back from the bottom. And what I did is I basically went and graphed this. And this is a really good idea, uh, very similar to actually seeing what actually happened in New Zealand. But the basic idea here in Australia was that ScoMo got elected because the, uh, the opposition were actually in a position that they had some policies that were potentially anti-property investment, particularly some things around negative gearing and depreciation schedules. Naturally, when ScoMo got elected in, there was a return to the bull run of what we actually go to see in relation to Australian property prices. We then had COVID happen. And whether or not you're in Australia or New Zealand, we literally saw property prices absolutely go up the fastest that we've ever seen on the inside of your career. And actually, when they get to the point of the peak, and the peak in New Zealand was probably in and around the November period, uh, here in Australia, we yet to see when that peak might actually happen. But when it does, it's usually over the course of the last 30 years, a 10 to 18 month period in decline, followed by then an 18 month point for it to level out to get back to where it currently is. Now, what we are actually saying to sellers is that Mr. and sellers, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you either sell today or you literally wait until 2025 when it's projected that your property will be worth the same amount that you'd be getting for it now. Now, what this actually does, that really does impact anyone who maybe bought a property from about June or July onwards, because anyone who bought from June and July onwards is ultimately going to be selling the property for potentially less than what they actually paid for their particular home. And that's a really interesting point because it does go to show you that the majority of the population, even if they sold their home today, would actually be selling at a profit compared to their original purchase price. Now, why is that such an important thing to know? It's about learning how to actually switch to now actually chasing buyers, not just chasing sellers. And also, too, to make sure that if you are in an environment where you've got some things that are coming up, that you're very clear on sellers about why they need to make the decision to go now. Now, I'll give you two narratives. If I was here in Australia, my big driver is, is that Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we definitely want to be selling in March and early April. We've certainly got a very disruptive April over the course of the Easter period followed by a federal election where everything effectively goes on pause. And that's a really important point and a reason why you should be listing today. Now, later on, we're going to have a new dialogue for them in May. But when we are at an election, we say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, things still go on regardless of the election. We know at the back of that, there's plenty of buyers that are left over. There's less competing homes on the market. Given your house is right next door to an election pre-polling booth, it would be a great idea to have your property on the market during this period. Now, if I was in New Zealand, what I'd be saying is, is that, you know, we have actually seen property prices rapidly grow. We're now in a position that we've hit the peak of market. We're now starting to slide back. And so it's massively important that we are getting you to sell now to maximize the sale price because elsewhere in a period, if it's anything like Australia, where it's a 10 to 18 month period of decreases in asking and sale prices before we hit the bottom of that market cycle. And that's a really important graph just to try to get people as focused as you can about what is actually happening inside of that marketplace. Now, off the back of that, I want you to start to you know, shift the gear because we now know that literally that we're going to be moving into a different cycle. And whenever it officially happens, the secret is absolutely making sure that you have understood the problem that the customer is trying to solve. Now, relevance drives all great relationships. And this is that whole idea is that how do we make ourselves super relevant to the buyers, super relevant to buyers and sellers, but also to super relevant to our current sellers that are already on market today. And this is where I'm really advocating that you go to have a look at the segmentation of your database, identifying who the best people are to go and have good quality conversations with. And this is actually saying, okay, who are the people that are opening the emails each and every week? And what additional email can I send? specifically just for those people that we know are buyers and sellers. Now, one of the conversations is this. I was working with a client recently, and when we went through her database, she'd actually been out to over 850 market appraisals over the course of the last five years. And I said to her, the best thing that she could do is to jump on the phone and go and ring every single one of those market appraisals. Hi, Hannah, it's Josh Fegan. Just thought I'd give you a quick courtesy call. 
You might remember we popped out to give you an idea on the value of your place. And I thought I'd just quickly check in to see how have things progressed? You know, what are the next steps? How can I help? And if I had a buyer, could I mention your place or should I sell them something else? Now, this is a great conversation because you're going to get plenty of those market appraisals say, you know what, I'm actually ready to go now. Let's go and have that conversation. Now, what will happen is that you're going to meet a number of buyers who are buyer sellers. And they're going to say to us, look, we cannot sell until we find something to buy. Now, the interesting conversation about that is that what are you doing in order to be able to go to progress them to the market? So, Mr. Mrs. Buyer Seller, let me just ask you a quick question. Are you in a position to buy a home having not yet sold yours? And they're going to say probably no to that. Say, okay, great. I'm just doing this for a few clients and it can be useful if it helps you. What we can do is that if we're actually in a position that we get you photographed, we get your contract organized, we get everything done as though you're going to go live to market, then we can go out there and find you what you want to purchase. When you find what you want, you let me know. And in under an hour, we press a button and naturally, we then get you onto the major real estate websites. With all the photography already done, the contract organized, we're already there. We get you on the website in under an hour or so. We get seven or eight buyers through in that first week. We get some great offers on the table on the property. So then you know exactly what you can sell yours. So then you can proceed with confidence in negotiation on the one that you want. And that way we can get you buying and selling in exactly the same market. Now that's such an interesting conversation because what it actually does is it encourages people to actually come forward and to go to market. Now, one of our clients in Melbourne, where I am today, they actually listed 31 properties that way in November. And what you've got to start thinking is that literally a seller will sell with you when you help them to solve the problem, which is not just the sale, but most importantly, in finding them something to go to buy. Now, why is this so critical? Well, I'm starting to get you to think about the difference around what you're actually doing inside of your database and what you're sending those specific customers at an email level. So you know what? Our market appraisals, what are they receiving? What do our buyer sellers receive in addition to what a buyer receives in terms of their buyer alerts? Now, at the end of the day, we can't settle for second. We've got to start thinking about how we really become role models in our industry. And this is that whole idea that you know we either do it well or we don't do it at all. And the challenge that I've got is I don't really have many people thinking about how they go to um, serve the people in their database in very different ways. Now, how you spend your time is your strategy. So if you really wanted to get some significant results, the best thing that you could do is to literally set aside a 45-minute session at the start of every business day. And during that 45-minute session, you're either on the phones or you're actually trying to create opportunity. And I love that because sitting inside of your database, there are some specific groups of people that you can go after. There's all the people, for example, that are receiving your email alerts that are opening them on a regular and consistent basis. There are those people that have actually unsubscribed from your email. And the reason why you want to ring them is you've got five business days to do so under the Privacy Act here in Australia. You want to try to find out why they're unsubscribing. Normally, people unsubscribe because they've just found something to buy. So can we actually be in a position that we go and have a conversation around that, that literally we are able to actually have a better quality conversation about what is actually happening in the market to be able to make some decisions from that point. Now, interesting enough, if they've actually just unsubscribed and they've actually just bought, they're either a future seller or maybe they've got an existing property that they need to sell given that they've just bought. And this is where literally, if you don't pick up the cues of what people are telling you in the digital environment, then how will you ever go to make the phone calls that really make the difference on the inside of your real estate career? Now, we know that we operate in a world that we go to call AI, IA, and HI. Now, AI is artificial intelligence. It's like Tesla have learned how to drive the car on the road without a human being being involved. We then got IA, which is what we go to call uh, information, so intelligence augmented. And with intelligence augmented, what we're thinking about is machine assisted decision making. So, for example, Netflix knows that I love to watch a series on Mexican drug lords. And so, off the back of that, they're serving me El Chapo and Narcos as an example because they know that that's my preference on what to watch. And then in addition to that, we've got something else that we go to call HI, which is human intelligence. Josh Fegan has turned up at the open for inspection. He has a tape measure, which probably means that he's not only going to buy the property, he's actually going to be in a position that he's going to start to have a bit of a conversation with us in, in terms of his negotiation. Now, it turns out that if you don't get the first name, the surname, the email address, and the mobile number into the database, then the IA and the AI 
actually doesn't work. And so this is where the HI is massively important to make sure that you're building that database on a regular and consistent basis. And what we have learned is that if you don't ask, then simply you don't get. Now think a little bit about this. Every single one of us is working with lots and lots of people at Open for Inspections on Saturdays, but are we actually truly finding the sellers? Now, one of the things that we can do is just to make sure that we ask the question. So when we're there at the open house, remember just to ask them, hey, have you bought locally before? If they say yes to that, then what are we actually doing to make sure that we can have some really good quality conversations? Now, I love that at the open for inspection. Hey, have you bought locally before? If they say yes, then what are your plans with the existing when you go to buy the next? And that's how naturally you turn buyers into sellers by just asking those very simple questions. Now that leads us into this whole idea about, you know, really mapping consumer experiences. And now as we snap back to the reality of the new world, we need to start thinking very differently about what are we doing with buyers? Now inside of ActivePipe, you've got your weekly wrap really set up. You know, that's that email. It literally has a list of all the different things that are going on inside of your agency. It's automated. But off the back of that, there's actually very specific buyer alerts. So these are properties that suit a particular client based on their particular price point and or area requirements. Now, this is really important to get back into measurement. How many of your buyers are subscribed to receive your email alerts? How many of them are updating their requirements? That's one of the great powers of ActivePipe is to make sure that we've got people updating their preferences. How many people through the reports are frequently clicking on those emails that are sent And how many of those people are showing digital intent and potentially even unsubscribing? Once we've got that, the skill of an agent inside of the real world is to make sure that they're doing a really good quality buyer callback, making sure they're doing that great 10-day callback, making sure that every buyer, as we referenced earlier today, is actually receiving that phone call when that particular property has been sold. So, hey, Hannah, it's Josh Fegan. Just thought I'd give you a quick courtesy call. We see that number one, Smith Street has actually just been sold. Did you hear how much it sold for? It sold for X, you know, based on that, what does that now mean your place is worth? And that's about having that pre-prepared list of the people that you're planning to go and get on the phone with. Now, what is staggering inside of the real estate training career that I've got is watching the number of people that will go out on a weekend that will meet 50 buyers as an example, but not know how many of those 50 buyers already own a home. So the absolute key here for success is to make sure that you're working to find out the ownership status of the buyer. So think a little bit about this. How many people did I meet on Saturday? How many of those people already own a property? How many of those buyers are out of area owners? How many of those buyers are landlords or investors? And how many of them are what we got to call first home buyers? Now, I love this whole idea about what we got to call the landlords or investors. Whenever I'm at an open for inspection, particularly on the lower end stock, If I meet somebody who says, hey, look, I'm an investor, you say, hey, you know what I love to do for investors? I love to pop out to your principal place of residence, give you an idea on what it's worth, so we know where your equity position sits, so then you can go to make some bigger and better decisions for the future. And that's really where the skill is, learning how to play in the moment so that we met X number of buyers on the weekend, and now we know that this is how many are in these particular categories. Now, it's really important that you're doing it while you're there at the open home, because if you don't do it at the open, by the time you get to the callback, you're going to lose at least 50% of the leads when they actually don't answer your phone. So it's really important that we make sure that we get that measurement right. Now, that's really um, what great agents do. They set the strategy. They get clear about who's actually doing it. They get clear about when we're asking these game-changing questions. They get clear on the language that they use. And then make sure that digital user experience of what our emails look like actually really relate to the customer and where they're at. Now, that leads you into the other whole idea here is that, you know, what you're actually doing is you're starting to think about how you go to work with your market appraisals. How are they receiving that justice that just sold email? So it is possible inside of ActivePipe to set up a little email alert that should a property be listed or sold within a 1.5 kilometer radius of the particular subject property that that particular person owns, that they receive an email on your behalf advising them of the latest listings and or sales. Also too, it's possible to segment out in your database, choose those specific people that are market appraisals, and maybe you send them a bit of a weekly market pulse. What's happening in your area in relation to new listings, in sales? What's happening with clearance rates? What are the insights that you're gaining 
to be able to give them the upper hand and most importantly, confidence to proceed. Now, what great agents do is they think that the goal of our current market appraisals is to get back in for a reappraisal or to get permission to bring a buyer through their home or to be in a position to take them to another home at a buyer level or to be in a position to connect them with what we've got to call our trade suppliers. And this is such an important part of what we're doing because it's like, how many people have we called? How many were face-to-face? How many of those people were we working the vision or the dissatisfaction? And how many of those people are we then reappointing? So our skill set, without a doubt, is to think, okay, great, we've got these great customer segments, buyers and market appraisals, but then there's also two, our past clients. Our past clients are a massive part of what we do. We now know that they can also receive those justice that just sold email alerts directly out of Active Pipe, but also too, you can actually go and choose a specific group of people and go to send them an email around their annual checkup. That then allows them to be able to book it directly from email to be able to get you to come out and give them an idea on what their property is actually worth. Now, in the real world, we're thinking, how many of these clients that have actually bought from us over the history of our career, have we actually booked in for an annual checkup? How many of them are we letting them know as a property is listed or sold as it happens because it might actually impact them? Now, what the best agents in the country do is that they actually go to the major real estate websites. They have a look at all the new listings in the course of the last 24 hours. They have a look at all the sales in the last 24 hours. And they then think, who needs to know about that particular listing or that particular sale? Now, the reason why that's such a critical component is that that is actually the thing that goes to drive the relevance. So how many past clients have you got? How many have you called this month? How many have you booked in for an annual checkup or let them know about a just, just listed or a just sold? And how many of them are you then moving into buyer appointments, marketplace, listing appointments, or getting a referral from? Now, this is like really important stuff because it changes the way that fundamentally you go to operate. Because when you get clear about why you do what you do, then you can scale that and ultimately go and do more of it. And that's such an important conversation because, you know, the secret to getting your success up there is to make sure that you know the numbers and then you go to work them. So inside of an agency, it's not just good enough to send out an email. We want to know who's actually opening and clicking through, who's actually those people that have got some digital intent. So then we can go and call them from our reports and actually get in front of the client. Now, at the end of the day, we all have 24 hours in a day. And our skill is to think about what we're actually worth. And so I'll give you a bit of an idea on this. And this is something that I like to do for people. Let's say, for example, that I go and I pull out the calculator. I say, okay, you, you assume to me, you say, Josh, you know what? I reckon 500 grand is a lot of money to earn per year. Well, we divide that effectively by 40. And then we divide that again by 40. That actually means that your hourly rate effectively sits at $312 an hour. Now, if you were worth $312 an hour, You wouldn't have any time whatsoever to be scrolling through social, to be in a position that you're being negative, to be insecure about what's actually going on. You'd absolutely be a true professional. Now, if you're a multi-million dollar agent, again, you're now worth close to a thousand bucks an hour. It would change the way that you go to do the work. Now, this is an important conversation because what do the greats do that allows them to earn 10 times the amount of money of their peers? And the secret is, is that the skill is to reduce what you do and do the part of the job that gets paid not by the hour, but on the result, which is where automation inside of what you're doing in the marketing world is massively important so that you know who is the next person that you're actually going to go and call. Now, this leads us to this whole idea that you really build a business based on systems. Now, systems are really important because you're saying, okay, what are the forms that we're going to fill out? What are the checklists that we're going to use? What are the, what's the dialogue that we're going to use? And then off the back of that, what are the visuals that we're going to use to be able to sell and tell a more powerful story? And this is such an important part because if you've got great systems, then the business operates. So for example, on a Friday, why don't you just pull out from ActivePipe your report on all of your unsubscribes and ring those people every Friday because that is going to help you to find some more potential sellers. Is it also too about getting that power of segmentation right so that your past clients might receive an annual checkup email in what you're doing inside of your Active Pipe software. Now, this is where forms are important. Checklists, those visuals and the language or the dialogue that you use makes a massive difference. And this is what the best do is that in every phone call, they're either booking for an appointment with the client or they're actually getting permission to continue that relationship over time. Now, here's what the greats do to simplify. 
calendar really is your life. So I want you to think that if you want to get more productivity, then what are you going to do to make sure that you really work that calendar? And that's about saying, okay, what time am I going to wake up each morning? How am I going to get getting the kids ready for school? Then literally come when school starts, I'm going to be in the office. I want to get that first 45 minute call session done. Let's go and find all the buyers that have actually been clicking on our active pipe emails and ring through those buyers to see if we can swing them onto a particular property and see whether they get come down for a private appointment to actually try to then get an offer on that particular home. Be clear on the terms of how you go to accept offers. This is a really important conversation because we want to make sure that those offers are going to stand up should the owner make the decision that they wish to proceed. And that's why we always love a contract, a 10% deposit as a part of that conversation. And this is really important that a buyer actually stand, it actually understands what they need from you. Now, we have seen some agents that have got some phenomenal email templates on this, that when a buyer requests things like a copy of a contract or a section 32, where I am here in Victoria today, then they are in a position that they also advise the buyer of what they would need should they wish to proceed forward with an offer. The name of the entity, the solicitor, the actual deposit amount, 10% or 20% as an example, via either a check or electronic funds transfer. In addition to that, the settlement timeline, any conditions that might actually come with their offer, and then the dollar figure itself. Now, if you give a buyer clarity that these are the things that you need, then it also gives them confidence to be able to go and participate in the marketplace. That also leads us into this whole conversation that we must communicate early so that everyone knows what actually goes to happen next. If you are in a position that a property isn't selling and an owner gives you an instruction to reduce the price, please make sure that you get a buyer through that particular home in the following 24 hours so they link price reduction actually equals buyer activity. And that's a really important idea because you don't want to be doing the hard work, not getting the buyers through, and then ultimately having a bit of a challenge. Now, the secret to this is that literally, if you get a price reduction of 20 grand, ringing back all the buyers that went through the home, I'm not sure that's the most productive activity because if it was really an issue over 20 grand, then the buyer probably would have made an offer anyway. So where the real skill is, is that how can you go in and identify who are some other buyers that we know through additional campaigns that we can either email or ultimately get on the phone to, to try to get them down to that particular property, get them to make an offer. And this is a great thing that if you get a buyer through in the following 24 hours, then ultimately they naturally move into a position that price reduction actually equals that buyer activity. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to go and make sure that we schedule our holidays 12 months in advance. And this is a really important mechanism that if you want to hit refresh, then you need to be able to learn how to go and play at your absolute best. And the whole idea is that you need to be growing the people around you and really thinking about the skills, the opportunity and the income that people can earn on the inside of your team. Now, one of the most powerful things that you can do is to think of what are your next five key skills that if you mastered, would change your confidence and actually change your level of momentum. And that may well be that you say, you know what, Josh, I've got to get better around my database segmentation. I've got to get better in reading those reports from my active pipe to make sure that I'm more consistent in the actions that I undertake as an agent. And this is about getting very specifics on about the markets that you go to serve. Because what we have learned is that, you know, where does the buyer come from before they buy? And where does the seller move to after they've sold? So if, for example, the seller sells here at 2 million and they go to a market where they buy in at three, that market where they buy in at three is a future market for you. And then all of a sudden, when the buyer is coming from a location at a million, you're now selling houses at 1 million, 2 million, and 3 million as you move up and down the price ranges of your area. And both of those markets are actually your next markets. Now, it's important that we get back to having a vision. As an agent, you've got to have clarity about the numbers that you actually want to go and achieve. You've got to be bold in the way that you've got to set that vision, and you've got to start to make sure that you track it and measure it on a regular and consistent basis. Now, this is the chart that we use to be able to help agents to perform at their absolute best. If, for example, you had a target of four listings per month, then you need to make sure you've got your first listing by the seventh day of the month, your second listing by the 14th day of the month, your third listing by the 21st day of the month, and your fourth listing by the time we get to the 28th day of the month. Now, if you write this up in terms of this, you send this off to your sales manager, to your principal, to your director, it is a great way to make sure that you're staying on track as the month progresses. 
And if you list consistently, then naturally you will sell consistently. Underneath that, we then go to have what we go to call our week to date, which is really making sure that you're driving your number of buyer appointments, market appraisals, and listing appointments. And if you can get this into double digit territory, aka 10 plus or ideally 15 appointments a week, your career will absolutely fly. And that's where you've got to start thinking that literally, am I really measuring? So if I go Friday, four o'clock, and I look back to Friday last week at four o'clock, how many buyer appointments, market prices, and listing appointments did I actually go to? And this is important because all success lives in serving that customer and never forget that, that that's ultimately what we're trying to do through those face-to-face appointments. Now, I want you to think about this as actually being your moment. You've just been through the biggest residential boom in your entire real estate career. There are some challenges that are ahead, both domestically, internationally, and around the globe. We need to make sure that we're absolutely playing at our best. And this is such an important part around what it is that we do, because we're starting to get you to think a little bit differently about how you actually go to provide better quality follow-up. And I love this whole idea because we spend hundreds of hours in creating opportunity and then 30 minutes in front of that client, but we fail at the finish line because we've got to fix our follow-up failure. Now, I love that whole idea is that, you know, what can we do next? How can we actually go to do it better? So we know that in your business that you've got great lists. You've got a seller hit list, people that are literally either signing with you, they've got a proposal, you're pitched on them, you're about to pitch on them. You know, it's either you or a competitor in the course of the next 24 hours. And that's a really important thing to think, what can I go to do next? We know that sitting in your businesses, there are hundreds, if not thousands of past market appraisals. What are we doing with those market appraisals to progress them to the market? And then also in your business, there is a group of people called buyer sellers that naturally, if we find them something to buy, then naturally they will go and sell their home. So what we actually do here is we get you into this whole idea of what actually happens next. Now, you've got to make sure that you add people to your market appraisal category inside of your CRM. That tag can then be used to be able to go and create some dynamic segmentation so that then you can do some very specific email campaigns to that group. You can add them to your buyer-seller list inside of your cam- your uh, CRM. So in that way, you can be sending the buyer-sellers a very specific email inside of ActivePipe around what has actually been listed and sold in your area in the course of the last seven days. You can then add them to our buyer-seller weekly email for total market listings and our sales summary. We can do our just-listed and our just-sold calls as they happen, but also to the just-listed and just-sold emails as it happens based on the automation that if they live within 1.5 kilometers of the subject property. We can also call people as an underbidder on a similar, similar property. Is there any chance that we can show them through? So Hannah, you know, really quick one. We just have the sale at number 26 Bridge Road. That particular property sold. We had three bidders on that particular home. There are two that are left over. What do you want me to do with the buyers? Is there any chance that I can mention your place or ultimately should I go and sell them something else? Then off the back of that thinking, we can call them because we've got something else for them to see. You know, can we spend an hour with me on Thursday so we can actually go and show you a couple of homes and see what it does to suit your requirements? Connecting them to our property service suppliers, painters, electricians, plumbers, massively important, but also to those invites to our auctions and opens. The real thing that I'm trying to get you to think about, it's what you do when things are quiet that makes all the difference when things really do get busy. And the skill of a great agent is to have that follow-up so they know what to do next to make sure they can go and perform at their absolute best. Remember, your job is to connect to the dreams, the aspirations, and the goals of the client, and you've got to be out there absolutely playing to your best. 